into a pandemic. We don't know when it will end. And what I'm starting to find um, and what I think started happening in the last few years is much more discussion around moving away from talking about diversity and inclusion and it being a nice to have and something over there to really taking action, to really making change and being responsible for that change. The reason why workplace experiences need to center the experiences of women of color is because we are on track to become the largest uh, demographic in the female workforce in time to come in the United States. And if you look at it from a global perspective, we do make up the largest majority uh, of women in the workplace. And so I think for far too long, diversity and inclusion, especially corporate diversity efforts, have centered women, uh, which they mean white women, and yet where some of the largest disparities lie, where there's huge opportunity for growth and change is by centering women of color. Uh, we know that the historical oppression of women of color because of the two marginalized identities that they carry, gender and race, uh, we know that they experience many more uh, challenges and obstacles to progress in the workplace, whether it be um, you know, pay inequity, whether it is opportunities to success, whether it is being thought of as leaders. There's a lot of work that can be done and must be done because for far too long, especially in Western workplaces, we have focused on how white women have progressed. In fact, McKinsey has excellent data on what that disparity really looks like uh, in the numbers. We know that less than 4% of women of color are in the American corporate C-suite. Um, you know, that number is nearly 20% for white women. So we know that there's a lot of work to be done. One of the reasons why this whole narrative around women leaning in really felt very unfamiliar to me is earlier on in my career as a woman of color, um, as someone who pursued, you know, academic education, who felt very, um, you know, felt very proud of my academic achievements and other work experiences, is I didn't feel like the biggest challenge to my career was a lack of confidence or leaning in. And when I would check in with other women, and especially women of color like me, um, who had you know gone through rigorous uh, academic training and other forms of pursuing really uh, amazing work experiences, we found again and again that actually leaning in was not where we were falling short. It was actually facing bias, facing discrimination, being thought of as less committed or less uh, leadership material like uh, by our peers and especially people in leadership. Leaning in does fall short. And in fact, even later on, once this narrative became very popularized and continues to be popular, some of the advice that's given to women, such as negotiate harder or be more confident or fake it till you make it, has actually found to be detrimental for women's careers. And it actually then puts the continues putting the onus on women to change when actually a lot of the challenges we face are systemic and need to be addressed by the organizations. So I think that leaning in as a catchy catchphrase had its, uh, you know, had its moment. When we think about movements such as the Me Too movement, when we think about movements for racial justice around the world, we know for sure that leaning in is not the answer to achieve any form of gender equality that is so sorely needed right now. Culture fit is coded bias, and I know this is hard to swallow because it's something that feels very normalized in corporate culture and actually in the various countries in the world that I've operated in and worked in, um, you know, talking about someone being a, a new hire or a candidate being a culture fit is very much part of the lexicon and everyone under, you know, everyone I think uh, understands it in theory that what it means to be a culture fit is to find someone who is exactly like what is existing in the corporation today, in the, in the team today. Unfortunately, it's coded bias, as I said. And what that means is 
if your team is largely made up of men, it's largely made up of white people, then culture fit often really, even at the most unconscious, subconscious level, means let's find other people who are already um, you know, like the team we have. We have a winning track record on our team the way that it is, and we don't need to diversify. And therefore, when people come in, especially women of color come in, um, obviously being not only racially and gender different uh, than what's already on the team, but also bringing in could be a different style of dress, could be a different style of speaking, uh, could be different work experiences, then we automatically reject them if we hire for culture fit. And therefore, I think it's much more important to hire for culture ad and focus on what do we lack today on the team? What sort, what measures of diversity uh, do we lack today and would really add to our team? Let's hire for that. And I think what's what's also important is to name that we want different that we want diversity on our team without saying we just want diverse people. I get a lot of, you know, can you please refer a diverse person to me? I have to double down and double click a little bit and say, what do you mean? What's a diverse person, right? And when you call someone a diverse person and what often they mean is racially uh, not white and ethnically not white or uh, gender diverse, um, you know, not male, not cis male, then often the response is just, oh, a diverse person is just a diverse person. Whereas I really uh, encourage, especially hiring managers and leaders to name what areas of diversity they want to focus on. If you can't name it, you're not going to be able to change it or measure it. Um, so again, we need more hiring managers to move away from the culture fit uh, equation and move towards culture ad. And also really important to not call anyone, any candidate or a group of people, diverse people. Again, in that moment, you're centering whiteness. One of the reasons why I believe corporate diversity efforts to date have uh, either failed to, to reach the targets that are set or, or have certainly not made the type of progress they want to um, is because it doesn't address the people aspect of it. I really want leaders and managers to sit down and to have and to stop and think and investigating our own biases, our own areas where we have privilege, what are the areas that we can use our influence and privilege for good, because that's what really moves the needle. It's not necessarily here's a big corporate diversity program, we're going to check the box and keep on moving. And part of that as a manager and leader is creating psychological safety. So building on uh, Dr. A Amy Edmondson's groundbreaking work on psychological safety, uh, where Dr. Edmondson really found that, especially in very tense and high risk situations, such as in the hospital, in the uh, neonatal intensive care unit, um, where psychological safety exists, where it doesn't matter who you are, what your rank is, and her and I have talked about how measures of diversity and underrepresentation, especially, you know, you could be a woman of color on the team who perhaps doesn't have the status and privilege of uh, the white leader, the white man leader on the team, and still having the safety to speak up, knowing that you can take a risk, knowing that perhaps you can disrupt the, the plan of action that's going to be happening. We're going to be administering this drug or we're going to be going down this surgery route, et cetera. But even if I don't have privilege and status, I can, I can jump in at that moment and say, actually, I don't think that's the right course of action. I can take a risk. I, can, I may, my idea may even be not the winning one. It might be a failure, but knowing that I'm not going to lose status, I'm not, you know, be, I'm not going to be humiliated is really important. Um, and that's what creates innovative teams, teams where there's high growth, where there's a lot of success are teams that have high psychological safety. There's multiple studies done since uh, Dr. Amy Edmondson's work on this. And so I think when we sort of supersede it with the diversity and inclusion lens, again, it's how do we create a culture where no matter what your background is, maybe I have an unfamiliar name, right? My name is Ruchika. It's not something that's very common in the American workforce, for example. And yet I shouldn't feel shame or awkwardness, pose my idea or take a risk. I shouldn't feel um, that I would lose status or I'd be considered less than. 
And so I think it's really important for managers and leaders to think about how do we create psychological safety in our teams today? How do we create space for people to take risks? Because we know taking risks and failing is really important uh, in terms of creating an innovative and high growth team and environment. The path to creating an inclusive culture and an inclusive society, both in and out of the workplace, is going to be bumpy and filled with failure. There is absolutely no way that we can make real change and have real growth without making some probably pretty big mistakes. I think the important thing to think about when it comes to inclusion is, unfortunately, most of us have not been modeled a very inclusive society um, as we were growing up and then certainly in the workplace. One study I found that three quarters of white people in America don't have a single friend of color and 91% of the average white person's social network is white. And so you can imagine that if you have not had interactions, any meaningful interactions with people who are different than you, people in early experiences have very little meaningful interactions with diversity. And for the same study, I found that actually uh, the first time that most uh, white Americans have any meaningful interactions with people who are different than them are in the workplace. And so suddenly, you know, you could go two decades, uh, could be even more without really interacting in any meaningful way with someone who's different than you. And then you're in the workplace and um, you're dealing and you're talking and you're connecting with and you're collaborating with people who are very different than you. So you are going to make mistakes, right? We This is a muscle that we all need to build and we need to train um, and, and we are going to make mistakes. One of the biggest challenges to diversity, equity and inclusion today is that people don't want to make mistakes. Yes, I can understand we don't want to hurt anyone we don't want to be the person who, you know, destroyed someone's career. But I would actually say by not engaging in those, you know, brave actions, by not taking those courageous steps forward, um, by not making time to understand where where we could improve, we actually continue more of the same. And status quo is not going to get us to a more inclusive workplace or society. Reporting the book was actually quite painful and traumatic. I didn't expect that. And after some of the, uh, you know, interviews I had with uh, women of color in the book, there were sometimes one or two days where I really needed to, you know, lie down and and think critically. You know, can this book make a difference? Because it feels like some of the challenges we're solving are so big and so overwhelming. What gives me hope, especially in the long run, is really this realization that I think more and more leaders, managers, people with privilege in society and in the workplace are starting to build is very inspiring and it's humbling. You know, I'm starting to hear um, more leaders I speak with say things like, I acknowledge I have privilege, you know, I want to learn more about intersectionality. I'm taking the time to read literature and books and media and listen to podcasts from people that I would never have even a few years ago. So I think that there is a social change and social movement building from the movement for racial justice, uh, especially spurred on by Black Lives Matter. Um, I feel very inspired by even the Me Too movement for all the uh, challenges that it brought to light. I am so inspired by the fact that now when I go into organizations, I will actually have conversations with people who say, um, you know, I would never have brought this this issue that I've been facing five years ago up because I thought it was too small or I just thought it's par for the course of being a woman in the workplace or working in a male dominated environment, but I'm going to bring it up and I'm going to say something. And on the flip side, it's also been really inspiring to hear from, um, again, people with privilege saying things like, I, you know, I recognize that I made this mistake and I'm going to uh, step up and take ownership to make change. So I think that that personal accountability, the personal responsibility, 
uh, the fact that I think we're recognizing more than ever that inclusion is a leadership trait gives me a lot of hope. Becoming an advocate for a more diverse and inclusive workplace is in the beginning when I was asked to come in to address organizations, I was often told, can you just talk about diversity, but don't mention race? And then I'd say, but what do you mean by talk about diversity then? And they'd say, you know, just women like lean in, topics like, you know, imposter syndrome and uh, and really just wanted surface level diversity, which centered high socioeconomic group, white women, essentially. What gives me hope now is in the last few years, nobody has asked me or has approached me certainly to talk about diversity and inclusion and said, please don't talk about race. In fact, more often than not, I'm now getting asked to really go to some of those challenging and vulnerable places. I'm starting to hear a lot more employees at different levels really speak up about challenges they've faced. And I think that rising tide is what's gonna lift all the boats. At least that's what gives me optimism. There's a personal success and then there's a societal success. So personal success would be that I'm not talking about this issue anymore. You know, and I render this part of what I do absolutely obsolete, because if I come in and say women of color are lacking in leadership, uh, people look at me and they laugh. You know, what do you mean by that? I can't even imagine that you're talking about a time where women of color don't have equal opportunities and rights as everyone else. So honestly, it's to render myself personally obsolete, especially in, in what I'm talking about right now. From a larger and societal standpoint, um, it's not only numbers, but of course, data and metrics count a lot. But back to this concept of psychological safety, it's this idea that when women of color walk into their workplace, they're seen as leaders, they're seen as innovators and trailblazers, they're recognized for bringing their authentic selves to work. They feel like they can fail, right, and take those risks and be the ones who raise their hands with those stupid questions um, and still be thought of as equally competent and equally uh, a leader. And for me, that is where I think we would really have moved the needle um, beyond where we are. But for me, it's what we don't even need to have this conversation anymore is, is when hopefully I can put these boots to rest.